in the message. Uh, I'm on a sort of different setup to normal in a, in a guest room in the parents' house. So this might be slightly less smooth um, than normal, but hopefully we can proceed anyway. Um, so if you haven't already, do make a copy of the Air Art Lesson 4 notebook. Um, we're going to be doing a slightly different lesson format today because this is kind of the final final piece, the final lesson of at least this first uh, course. Um, I thought we'd rather than trying to introduce too much new stuff, we'd just take the tools that we've learned and try out a few additional experiments with them, play around with some different demos. Um, so it's lots of short little sections. Um, so the way I've set up the notebook, the downloads is going to download like the VQGAN weights and the clip model, um, install some prerequisites. Um, but then after that, the setup does the imports and sets up all the sort of groundwork that you'll need and then each section can be run kind of independently. So if you haven't already, um, run the downloads, get those pre-trained models downloaded, run the setup to import everything, and we'll dive right into our first, um, yeah, first little expansion of something that we covered in lesson three. And as always, if you've got questions, chuck them in the chat. I'll be trying to keep an eye on it on my phone. Um, but you're also welcome to unmute and just say them out loud. That'll probably be even easier. Um, yeah, but totally up to you. And if there's anything that you'd like to explore, I have a feeling the actual content will take less time this lesson, but we'll have lots of space for um, taking things further, experimenting. Um, if anyone has any ideas that they'd like to try and implement, we can do that together live. Um, okay, so provided we run our first few sections, um, the first thing we're going to do is quite a popular extension of um, the sort of generative stuff that we saw in Lesson 3, right? Remember in Lesson 3, we covered um, VQGAN and CLIP and then combining them together, excuse me, like, um, a little bit further here, like this, where we're generating an image, comparing it to a text prompt, and then based on that loss, updating the latent representation so that we decode into a, an image that's closer and kind of repeating this cycle. Um, so for this first demo, what we're going to do is effectively the same loop, right? I, I copied and pasted the code from that lesson, um, but with one key modification, we're going to add every few iterations, we're going to add a transform. Um, so let's set this running. Um, we're going to only start the transforms once it's generated a base image, um, and we should see uh, something gradually emerging. I think I said a vortex of blue fire and lighting. You can change that prompt. In fact, please do. Um, but as it emerges, it's just sort of standard GAN generation. Um, but if we inspect the code, we'll see that after some number of iterations, right, if we've passed this number of iterations, um, every, in this case, five iterations or however many you set, we're going to get our image out, right, turn it into a PIL image, just because that's an easier way to do some of these transforms. And then we're going to resize it to do a bit of zoom. We're going to rotate it to spin it a little bit. And then we're going to slap this transform version back over the original um, and re-encode this back into Z. So we're going to have a new starting point. Um, we're going to set up the optimizer and everything so that from now on, it's going to be optimizing this kind of new image. And if we look at the output and see um, how that's going, um, you'll see that it's, it's gradually zooming in and turning just a little bit every five iterations. And it's also saving that image. So once that's finished, or if you want to see the results of the previous run, um, we get this kind of neat trippy effect, right? As we hit that threshold, we start zooming in um, and it's just continuously generating to match that same prompt. Um, and you can run this for a lot longer, right? I think we set it to some maximum 350 iterations, um, but there's no reason you can't say 3000 iterations or um, yeah, <laughs> play around a little bit and try to make it um, loop as seamlessly as possible. Um, yeah, get some cool effects. Um, so this this idea, I mean, this is one particular example, one that's fairly popular and, and I think pretty cool. Um, but there's no reason you have to restrict yourself to these transforms. Um, because we now have this as an image, you can modify this in whatever way you want. So the rest of the training loop looks very much like everything else. We zero the gradients, we get our output, we calculate our loss, we update the parameters to improve that loss, um, but we just have this additional thing here. If we're greater than some number and every five iterations or whatever, we are turning this into an image and then applying some, some modification. 
you can imagine um, you could uh, do some crazy warping. You could just shift it by a few pixels each time. Um, you could uh, change the colors slightly. Um, so this general pattern, this this um, approach of iterate towards a prompt for a few a few steps, uh, apply a transform, do a few more steps, apply a transform. Very powerful and very general. Um, so are there any questions on that? Let me check the let me check the chat. Um, okay, we have a couple of people saying the sound is okay. Um, Hannah, if the video is still giving trouble, um, yeah, maybe we can try changing the Discord region again. That sometimes seems to help these things. Um, but if it's okay for others, then we'll stick with it for now. Um, Darkside has a comment. We want to move forward, but the, everything is so much to dive into. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that, especially like this notebook. You have these big walls of text, right? Like when I click show code, we suddenly got a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, so yeah, you're welcome to, if you've got specific, um, specific questions, we can, we can sort of dive in maybe offline on the chat. Um, but this is also, it looks complicated, but I think it's something that comes with a lot of programming is you start to like, um, group things into patterns that you've seen before. And so my advice, maybe if this is all looking too crazy, would be to go right back to lesson one, where we are just optimizing one simple little function. Uh, to try and fit some data with a, a very few set of parameters. Um, and this is our kind of same template, right? So we have some parameters, we have an optimizer, we're keeping track of some of the losses over time, and then we're doing the same loop, zeroing the gradients, getting our outputs, finding a loss, storing, displaying, and then updating our parameters. And so although we keep adding sprinkles and additions on top, the core of that is the same. Um, oh, we have the first output in the Discord chat. Excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Um, a vortex of cartoon cats. Um, <laughs> I should probably play that on the screen, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, please do. This lesson is going to have lots of little demos that you can do. Um, please do post your outputs as we go. And then also um, additionally. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you can tweak what's going on. Um, let me just check the message. Um, you can change how long it spends on each frame of this final video, right? Because you're only applying this transform every, in this case, five iterations. Um, so if you make this a smaller number, like if we said we're going to apply a transform every iteration, every step, what you're going to see is that the GAN struggles to keep coherence. And so once we get to, we'll have to wait for it to start actually zooming. Um, it can kind of lose and, and move further away from the prompt and lose any sort of coherence. And you get these really weird sort of spirals and swirls and feedback patterns, which can be interesting, um, but it can also be a bit annoying. So the fix there would be to give it more time to kind of update on each frame. Um, and you can do that by setting the transform everyone. You could also use a slightly more aggressive learning rate so that each step we're doing a larger update. Um, yeah, so that would be my advice for avoiding that. Um, but it can be really fun to experiment because obviously the less time you spend on each frame, um, the faster you can generate your final animation. Um, but you risk you run the risk of losing any resemblance to your prompt um, and it can start to just generate random lines. Um, okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Google Colab is so slow. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, some sometimes it's luck of the draw whether you get a good GPU or not. Um, but make sure you you are running on a GPU runtime rather than with um, no hardware acceleration. Otherwise, that will be quite slow. Um, but yeah, remember also in this case, we're not just generating a single image, we're generating an animation. And so one of the themes of today's notebook, you'll see because we're spending some amount of time for every frame, um, the maths, even if it's only 10 seconds per frame, if you want to make a five minute video, that's very quickly hours and hours and hours of computation. So it's always worth trying things at a smaller scale, um, trying things, you know, on a small number of frames before you commit to a long run. Um, yeah, anyway, you can see here, um, the loss curve is helpful to show. We're zooming in too fast and it's getting further and further away from the, the text prompt that we wanted. And this looks less like a vortex of fire and more like some abstract blue lines. So that would be a, an example of maybe a, a, a time when you'd want to spend more iterations on every frame and increase this to five or 10, um, up to you to experiment. 
Um, okay, but we won't run that for now. Um, so any questions on this this application? I'll show a little demo um, while I wait. And um, yeah, if you have any like thoughts on potential applications or Let's move on to uh, section two. Um, oops. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to get rid of that annoying little notification by manually saving. Okay, so that was that was um, trick number one: uh, doing some transforms to the image in between, updating it in our normal manner. Um, and as Remy notes, adding sound makes that even more fun. Um, so now something that I've talked about in previous lessons, but worth just um, explicitly showing in this one. Um, we've seen various different loss functions, right? In lesson one, we saw loss functions that was just measuring um, how well does some line match some set of data, right? So that would be our very first simple one. Um, but since then, we saw clip used to compare an image with some text. But we also saw, like in, in lesson two, um, we saw a, a measure of how well the style of an image matches another image, right? We call it style loss. And how well the content, like the overall structure matches, which we called content loss. And so this implementation from lesson two, I've kind of just copied across into lesson three. And um, you can check out the setup at the top to see where we define those functions. Um, but what this gives us is the ability to combine these. So you can see here, this is the, the key bit of code from this next section. We are calculating a content loss between our image, our generated image and some target, and a style loss and a clip loss. And we're just combining them together. So this loss is the content loss plus the style loss plus the clip loss, and all of them multiplied by some weight so we can control how much each contributes. And um, by, by putting these together, we can get a bit more fine grained control. We can say we'd like to generate an image that has the overall structure of this cat picture with a bit of the style of this fire image but also similar to this text prompt. And so you can see, um, I'm hoping you can see, have I lost everyone? Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, I can see. Okay, great. Um, I think our power dipped briefly, but the Wi-Fi should be on. I think I switched it over to the solar. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so if this works right, hopefully, we'll see something that uses um, these different ideas, right? A text prompt and a style guide and a content image um, and gives us some result that has a mix of those different losses. Um, for this demo, I didn't use a GAN to generate. I just did something that's a step above just raw RGB optimization. Um, so you can look into the linked um, notebook, I think I, I point to it here, yeah, this image stack class, basically just raw RGB, except that it's able to learn a little bit more quickly and give a bit more consistent output. Um, but you can see a very quick demo. And if you want to change these um, values here, like if we remove the content weight, we'll get something completely different because now it's not trying to imitate the structure. It's just trying to generically match this text prompt and the style prompt. So you can see here the style is looking pretty good. We've got lots of flames not really seeing any rainbow cats anymore. So that structure there is definitely coming from the content loss. Um, likewise, if we were to increase this and decrease our style loss, uh, style weight entirely, we'd get a, a different effect. We wouldn't see any of those little flames. We'd see something just like, um, yeah, like the, the, the content image with some different style based on the clip alone. Um, so you can see how by having these different tools in our toolbox, we can really start to fine tune what our output looks like, right? We have a, a way of measuring how well an image matches text and that's really powerful on its own, but it's also nice sometimes to be able to enforce a bit of structure or encourage the model to move towards an output that resembles a certain style. 
Um, and so having all of these different options, um, yeah, being able to stack them together just gives a little bit more control. And I think that's one of the goals of this course um, was to say, look, we can, we can generate these things, but we can also really have artistic input. If we understand the code and we can come in and see, we're getting our content features, we're calculating a content loss, we're getting our style features, making a style loss, using some weight to control how much each contributes. Um, and so we can go and kind of mess with this and you can add many additional losses. You could add a loss function that says, I would like to enforce mostly monochrome. And so I'm going to penalize anywhere where the, the um, saturation is high. Or you could add a loss that says, I'd like this to be as smooth as possible. So you can penalize any image that has high frequency noise. Um, the kind of results are, are very much up to you. Um, but I thought that would be a fun, yeah, a fun little demo to say, you know, we can combine these tools from the different lessons and sort of just mix and match. Um, any questions on, on that section? Uh, no pressure, Remy and TBH, we can see that you're typing. <laughs> okay, all is clear for now. Excellent. Like I said, if you've got, um, if you've got uh, questions about this lesson or if there's a particular um, section that you'd like to dwell on, um, we can always come back and write our own code and modify it and try and achieve some specific effect. Um, but for now, I'll just keep moving on through. Um, <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, oh, one, one more message. Um, okay, great. <laughs> Everyone's typing and, and putting things. Um, cool. Uh, custom drawing code. Oh, I've just passed what Remy said. Yes, you can add um, add additional loss functions to try and control the output. Um, TV loss was mentioned for trying to make it smoother. Um, you can also use clip with a negative prompt. So try and try and make it as as far away from a prompt as as possible. And so if you add a prompt that says something like uh, RGB rainbow noise it's going to try and avoid looking like that. So you can also use a little hack like that. Um, okay, so the next section is one that some of you have been playing with, I know from the Discord. If we can make an image from some parameters, then we can make art with it. And that's kind of a, a bold statement, but um, the idea with this one here is that we don't need to restrict ourselves to, say, using a GAN to generate images. If we can make an image in some way that's kind of differentiable and modifiable, um, then we can iteratively update those parameters to get closer and closer to some goal. And again, we can use the goal of a style loss, a content loss, or clip. Um, so in this example here, we're gonna create a really bad way of drawing images, right? Which is just to mix a bunch of blobs of different colors. Um, and we're gonna start from this and see if we can change the parameters of these blobs, the position, the color, the size, um, such that over time they resemble some prompt, right? So let's go a red jellyfish in a blue ocean um, and then while this is running we can uh, we can dig into the code um, so here there's no GAN involved instead what I've done is create this custom class um, where we have some number of points and an, an image size width and height and then each of these points has some parameters right the position so X and Y the, the size the fall off the color the intensity and each of those parameters is going to be um, group together in the self.params. We setting requires grad, so we're saying PyTorch keep track of the gradients for these parameters. Um, and then in the forward method of this class, because it inherits from nn.module, we can um, call it like a function, and we're going to run this forward method. We're going to start with a blank canvas, and then for every point, we're just going to draw, we're going to calculate the distance of each pixel to that point. We're going to run that distance through a smooth sigmoidal function, which you can you can plot that out and, and go look it up. It's just going to give us a nice smooth fall off um, so that we start at, at the location of the point. We start at maximum intensity and then we gradually drop off after some distance. Um, and if we if we try this out, right, we create an instance of our class. Um, if we call d.mr or d.forward, we're going to get some image that's made up of all of these points. And the important thing here is that if we want to change the appearance, we can modify these parameters, right? The coordinates, the sizes, the colors, etc. cetera. Um, so if we check out our optimization loop, you'll see that we are setting a text prompt as our target. Um, excuse that noise in the background there, these things called bush babies or greater galagos. 
um, but they sound quite alarming if that's coming through in the microphone. Um, yeah, so we're saying create one of these things with 200 different dots. Um, we're setting up an optimizer. We're storing our losses. All of this just copied and pasted from the previous ones. And then here, zeroing out the gradients, generating our image, right, which is just calling our sort of dot generator, um, encoding that with clip, calculating our loss, um, storing it for later, updating our parameters, and showing the result. And you can see from something that looked um, like this sort of magical mix of random colors, we're getting something that at least sort of resembles, if you blur your eyes, something red and something blue, um, and generously a red jellyfish in a blue ocean, which is exactly what we asked for. Um, so it's, it's very limited. Obviously, this particular implementation is just for demonstration. Um, but the idea here, the sort of broader idea, um, is that you can set up some system of making an image, whether that's drawing lines, whether that's um, mixing together different functions, overlaying different images on top of each other, um, and then provided it's controlled by some parameters and it's differentiable, then we can use the same sort of approach that we've been exploring to hopefully generate something fairly interesting. I heard a Discord notification. Ah, oh, we've got some, some outputs from the previous one. Uh, Sci-fi spaceships, excellent. Keep them coming, everyone. Um, it always makes my day when I see the, <laughs> see the pictures. Um, yeah, quick little demo of um, the same idea taken a, l a little bit further. Um, these are all um, same sort of idea, points with a sigmoidal fall off, um, but in 3D space, and then looking at it from different angles to be different prompts. So this I think was a city at night. Um, these should be spinning around, but they're all frozen at the moment. This was autumn, a picture drawn in autumn. Um, so, some other ones you can go and explore. I'll, I'll put the link in the notebook. I think it's there already. Um, but you can see by, by sort of enforcing some limitation, it's never going to not look like a bunch of blurry dots, but suddenly we can start to get something that's quite aesthetically appealing. Um, and instead of having to manually create something that looks like a jellyfish, we can just use this magical AI model that we call clip um, or some other loss, right? A, a, a similarity loss, perceptual similarity based on content and style um, to try and match some image as closely as possible, even though we've just got some limited method of drawing. Um, okay, any questions on <laughs> this kind of crazy little uh, demo of something very custom for generating images as opposed to relying on it again or raw RGB optimization? Yeah, sorry, I, I kind of didn't get the general art. Uh, we have the attribute uh, and we can be we're off time we optimize it. That's the point. Of um, I didn't catch too much of that. My network down is a little bit bad. Um, but am I right in saying that you were asking about the actual architecture that we're using to generate these little dots and things? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on it because it's just one example. Um, but you're right. I shouldn't have glossed fast. So let's, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So um, we're setting up this thing as a class. You could do this in other ways, but this is a nice way of keeping it organized. And so this init function is going to be just setting up all the variables that we need, right? Setting our initial parameters and so on. Um, so we're going to have some number of points and we're drawing some image size. Um, and so I'm setting up a grid, right? And if you look at the output here, you can see we have one image that's just every pixel is kind of the intensity is the X position, right? So here is X of zero, here is X of one. And you can see the color here sort of matches that. So we have an X grid and a Y grid. And so if we have some function that takes in X and Y and gives out, say, a color, um, then we can feed in this grid and get out some result. Um, and so when we want to actually see that function, we're going to look now to the forward method. And this is going to say, okay, create, create a, can, uh, a canvas, which is just um, this sort of width by height grid, um, but with three channels. So if we were to, to look at canvas.shape, it would be three by width by height, right? So this is our sort of blank canvas, and this is the pixels of the image that we want to draw. Um, then for each point, we have the color, red, green, and blue. We have the intensity, and I'm just 
getting these intensities from the parameters that we've set up. We have the um, location, x and y. We have a size and we have a fall off, like how smoothly does it fade out. Um, so if I want to go from this information plus my grid to what color should I draw on the grid, um, the first step that I do here is I calculate the distance from the point, this px, um, to every pixel on the grid. So um, if I feed in here, for example, up top left, might be 0 and uh, 1 on x and y, um, then that's going to be quite far from a point that's down here in the bottom right. So I'm calculating this distance, and this is going to be stored in this sort of temporary variable here. And this is going to have the distance for every pixel in the grid. Um, now I'd like to turn that into an intensity. So I'm saying uh, 1 minus, because we want to get less intensity as we get further away. Um, the distance times some fall off. And then the sigmoidal function is just smoothing things. So it's going to start out at 0 when the distance is really low. And then it's going to gradually increase and go to 1 as the distance gets higher. Um, so by saying 1 minus that, I'm saying I'd like to start at 1. And as we get further away, I'd like to drop down towards 0. Um, so this is going to give me this kind of smooth drop off as we get further and further away from the point. And then I'm just multiplying the color of this point, uh, red, green, and blue, um, by this distance, this dropping off distance. And then multiplying it again by this intensity so that some will be brighter and some will be dimmer. Um, and I'm doing this for every single point. And so they're kind of stacking on top of each other. Um, and so then at the end, this little extra line here is just saying this image is going to be way too bright if we've added up hundreds of points. So I'm going to scale it back down to a more reasonable range. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a slightly involved process. Um, but what it's built up from, you could start without a lot of this and say, first of all, I'd like to just draw one point. Right? I'd like to have a black and white image where it's white near the center and getting black as you move further away. And then as I'm coding this, I've just gradually added, okay, now let me keep track of three different channels for three different colors. Um, let me add a smoother fall off with the sigmoid. Let me add parameters to control how quickly it falls off and how sharply. Um, let me add different colors for each one. Let me add intensity so that it's brighter or darker. Um, so I don't just sit down and write all 50 lines of code here. Um, it's more like starting out with something really simple and saying, oh, Ultimately, how can I draw an image based on a few parameters, like x and y position and intensity? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, everything is like, it makes a lot of sense now. I was kind of trying for a neural network, so I was imagining and we optimize those weights, but I guess we'll do it in the next section. So I kind of skipped ahead. And... Yeah, so in this one, there's no neural networks whatsoever other than the clip that's doing the loss. So in previous ones, we're optimizing something fed into a GAN or we're optimizing a network. Um, but here we're just going to be saying well, the actual parameters that we're modifying is the D dot parameters, which is if you go back and look at the code, it's going to be um, the self params is just the coordinates, the sizes, the colors, the fall-offs, etc. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, and yeah, takeaway of this section is just that however you want to draw something, if you can differentiate it, then you can optimize it. <laughs> At least that's the dream. Um, and you can go and see some, some really cool implementations. Um, if you look up uh, clip draw, um, this is, okay apparently some gun thing. Um, <laughs> um, here we go. This looks something a bit better. Um, so they use a library for differentiable drawing of shapes. Um, and so they're able to uh, create these kind of cartoony pictures um, with this exact same approach, right? If you go in and check out the code here, you'll see it looks very similar. Um, uh, where, where are we? So for some number of iterations, we're zeroing out the gradients. We're rendering our image somehow. Um, we are calculating some loss. We're back propagating our error. Then we're updating our 
parameters with our optimizers um, and optionally showing some output, right? So a lot of extra stuff in there, um, but the, the core idea is the same. You have a way of drawing based on some parameters, right? Line width, line color, positions of the different key points. Um, then you can generate something based on a piece of text. So yeah, there's much better implementations than my weird little dots, but they make me happy. Um, yeah, uh, Remy is posting in the chat um, exactly what I hoped would happen. Um, these images that he's showing here, um, you can see more in projects and sharing. They're not made up by optimizing raw RGB pixels, but instead uh, a whole bunch of these little Gabor um, patterns, right? These little light and dark patterns stacked on top of each other. Um, and so again, that's a, a very different way of drawing an image. Um, but you can still optimize the position, the angle, the phase, the color of these little patterns and stack them all on top of each other and end up with something very cool. Um, so that's a, yeah, that's a really great example. Um, and that's exactly the kind of project that I was hoping would, um, would come out of this course and this section specifically. Cool, I'm gonna move on to the next one, but we can always come back and try and make a different differentiable drawing method if you'd like to try something specific. Um, or we could go and um, maybe as a, a bonus um, read the differentiable drawing paper that I shared or look at clip draw in a bit more detail. Um, but for now, let's move on to another common one. So we're going back into the familiar world of GANs. <laughs> um, not familiar if you've only just done the course, but um, a tool that we've used before rather than this kind of crazy custom thing. Um, so here I've basically copied and pasted the code from, what was it, section one, right? Here where we um, created some image and then gradually zoomed in. Uh, the only difference is I've added um, a few lines. So within our optimization loop, I've changed the target, right? We started with um, a vortex of blue fire as our prompt. Um, once we get to 100 iterations, we're changing the target to a live volcano. Once we get to 200 iterations, we're changing the target to an ocean with waves. And so um, we can see that in the code and I'll set it running while we do. Um, this is meaning that we're starting out from random and we're moving towards some vortex of blue fire, which is fine. And But you can see here right at the end, after we've done everything else, we, we're doing our continuous up updates, we're um, zeroing the gradients, we're getting our output, we're finding our loss, we're updating our parameters. Um, then we've got this optional transform. Every few iterations, we're zooming in and rotating. That's still there. Um, and then there's this final thing, which is just changing the goalpost, right? So after iteration 100, the loss is no longer going to be um, comparing our original text. Instead, it's going to have this new target, which is um, a live volcano. And you can see here the loss gets better and better. Then as we change the, the target, obviously, it looks like a blue vortex, not a live volcano. So the loss increases and then it gets better and better. Now this looks like lava. And then once we get to... Um, the iteration 200, we're going to change the target again, and it's going to get worse because it doesn't look like an ocean at the moment, it looks like lava. Um, so the loss is going to jump up, but then it's going to gradually move towards this um, this new target. So you can see very quickly, this now looks like kind of waves on an ocean with a bit of imagination, um, and it's going to look more and more like that. And so the final result, this is from a previous run, um, looks something like this. And so you can imagine, um, we can really have fun with this, right? You could time these changes so that they coincided with lyrics in a song, right? So every line of the lyrics, you have a different text target, maybe that line of lyrics or maybe something related. Um, and so that as it's every beat's happening, the target's changing and the imagery is shifting to match whatever's being said. Um, so you can get really creative that way. Um, you can also change other parameters like this, right? So if text embed is equal to 100, change the direction of the rotation. Um, we'll have the rotation vary back and forth in some sort of sinusoidal manner. Um, yeah, so quick little demo. Um, in this case, the changes are quite harsh. Um, so I make a recommendation here. If you want to smooth that out, you can always um, do some combination, right? Calculate the loss with respect to one target prompt and a different loss of a second prompt. And then over time, just change how much each of those losses contributes to the the final one that you use for your optimization. Um, so pretty powerful technique, really fun to mess around with. Um, yeah, you can you're welcome to 
take this idea and run with it, um, you know, run this for many more iterations, have multiple different successive um, prompts or, or slightly shifting targets, add multiple prompts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Remy says, I bet you could make this into a perfect loop if you give it the start point as a target at the end with increasing weight. Uh, yes, that is one option. You can try and make it so that it syncs back up to, for example, we went back to whatever our initial prompt was, um, but it is tricky to get it looking exact unless you store the first Z, right? You store the latent representation of whatever our starting point was. Um, and then you just interpolate in Z space, getting closer and closer to that value. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit tricky with the random rotations and zooms going on, but it's it's very possible to get these into seamless loops. Uh, you can also do what I often do, which is just generate a really long video, and then at some point just cut the video and have it fade into itself. Um, and generally, people don't notice that, <laughs> so you can you can get away without having to do everything perfectly, especially if there's lots of motion and um, shifting scenes and stuff. Having a, a sort of nice transition center zoom or whatever um that also works fine and i've used this in a bunch of um a bunch of my own pieces I'm, i'll have to go back a little bit i think to to find lots of these zooms but yeah very very satisfying um i think all of these ones were um very satisfying to have this slow gradual change and have something dynamic rather than static um yeah my internet download speed is really slow but I can post this link in the chat if anyone's interested. Um, this was just four different um, zooms, uh, each zooming fairly slowly with some prompt along the lines of a wizard tower or something like that. Um, but yeah, very fun little creative exploration and ch changing these targets, especially like in line with lyrics or something, um, really, really fun. Cool, any questions on messing about with successive targets? I can't remember who requested this topic, but I think it's a it's a good one. Um, so I'll give a give a second or two for input there. Actually, let me not <laughs> let me not put pressure on everyone seeing that their uh, typing is being shared. I'll on my phone for questions. Um, but in the meantime, I'll start to slowly move on to the the final section. Like I said, today is shorter and more informal, um, and just a set of demos that you can take and play around with. Um, so, ah, some comments that, <laughs> yes, um, please do play around with this after class. I know we're moving quite fast now, and it takes a while to generate. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll go through there. Um, okay, and then Remy is already ahead of us, moving on onto the video section. Um, so let's talk about working with with moving pictures, aka video, a technology that's been around for a while. We've made videos, right? These previous sections had these kind of zooming effects by generating one frame after the next. Um, but what if we want to work with some input video? So I link here this um, pixel.com is where I downloaded this video. I'm not sure about the copyright of actually sharing it, but it's free to use, free to download. Um, when I publish this course somewhere more permanent, I'll probably use my own video instead to kind of avoid any of those issues. Um, but for now, download this in the lowest possible quality, um, upload it via the files panel. Um, so I'm going to upload dog running, um, which is what I called it. You can give it a different name. Um, and so we're going to work with this video and let's think of some of the approaches we might take um, if we wanted to, for example, style this video using a clip prompt, right? The the most obvious one that leaps to mind would be something like, uh, let's just take every individual frame of this video and let's run this optimization loop with that frame as the initial image, right? So let's start, start on that image um, and then each one successively, right? Here, neat little command, FFmpeg is general purpose tool for wrangling video and images. Um, so he's saying take in this dog running mp4 and output this um, little pattern here says um, four digits increasing one by one each frame um, and so it's going to store the frames of this video in this new folder um, for us to work on individually um, so you can imagine we could load each frame we could optimize it towards some prompt and then we could save the results 
Um, and this is going to take a little while because you're going to do this for every frame. Um, and we're going to spend some number of iterations on each frame. Um, so let's, let's look at the code for that. Um, for now, I'm going to set content weight to zero. So everything related to content loss, we can ignore. Um, and in fact, let me make this a little bit easier to see. Yeah, so we're going to set some parameters. We're going to set uh, the Hicktober prompt for today was Night of the Wolf, hence the theme. Um, so we're going to set some text, set some parameters. And one here is that we're going to say for every frame, we're going to spend 10 iterations on that frame. So we're going to load in an image, right? We're going to start with the first frame, frame zero. We're going to set up an optimizer. And then for each frame, we're going to do some work. Uh, this is for the content loss, which we'll talk about just now. You can ignore that because we set our content weight as zero. Um, and then here, I've uncommented this by default. We are going to load up the frame that we want to work on. We're going to encode it into our Z value. And we're going to tell the optimizer that this is now the Z value that we're working on. Then for some number of iterations, we're going to do our standard thing. We're going to zero out the gradients, get the output, calculate the loss, um, we don't have to worry about the content loss because this weight is zero. Um, and then we're going to update our parameters. In this case, just looking at our prompt, which was a painting of a wolf or whatever. Um, and we're going to do this 10 times per frame. And then we're going to move on to the next frame. We're going to load up the next, um, the next frame. We're going to convert that to Z. We're going to start again. So as it is here, this is not keeping anything from the previous frame. It's just recreating a new frame each time. And if you watch the result, you'll, you'll see that that's mirrored in what we see, right? Even though this is only spent 10 iterations per frame, it's enough for everything to diverge quite dramatically from the guiding video, right? The original video is, is this nice, smooth, slow motion footage of a dog. Um, so we get a lot of flicker. We get a lot of kind of craziness happening. Um, and there's no coherence frame to frame. It looks really cool. And this is definitely a, an effect, right? You might be going for that effect. Um, but it's also a bit chaotic. And so the question becomes, how do we, how do we guide this process into something a little bit more structured? Um, so I'm going to stop this because the, the output I just showed there is the results. And this is going to take uh, a lot of time to run um, because we're running 10 iterations per frame and there's 250 frames. So it's going to take 10 minutes or whatever to finish. Um, so instead you might think, okay, well, what if instead of starting from a new set of Z values each time, we comment that out, right? So we're going to comment out this bit here. We're going to say, we're just going to keep with one GAN output and we're just going to update it every frame. Um, how do we make it change so that it resembles the next frame? How do we keep this updating so that it follows the video rather than just generating an image? Um, and the second idea that a lot of people have is to say, well, why don't we use something like the content loss that we defined previously, right? We use how does this generated image resemble structurally the frame that we're interested in? And so that's what this content weight parameter is going to do. Let's set this to one. Um, here, when we, as we move on to each new frame, we're going to load up that frame as our content target. And we're going to try and optimize our image so that it matches the clip prompt but also so that its structure matches the structure of this target frame. In other words, the, the guiding frame, the initial video frame. And so that's where we get this. Um, we're extracting the content features of our generated image, and we're including that in our loss, right? And you can run this, um, but again, spoiler alert, the results are going to be a little bit disappointing um, because it's hard for VQGAN. You can imagine it's generated this structure that resembles the first image. It's hard for it to completely shift its output. Um, for the next frame. And so it will slowly, gradually, sometimes shift a little bit. And if you spend lots of iterations per frame and you really have a high emphasis on the content loss, then maybe you'll see some motion. Um, but on its own, this doesn't work particularly well. You end up with just this kind of static image with random bits of movement or small artifacts from the content loss. Um, so again, not a perfect solution. So I'm going to stop this once more. You can run that if you'd like. Um, so this first little section of code here, which I'll now um, hide the code for, um, this is kind of showing us uh, some options that can be interesting artistically, right? It, 
you, you might want this kind of flickery, unreal, sort of slightly disturbing output. Um, and you can manage this. I think I linked someone on Twitter that I saw, yeah, just um, yesterday shared their version of this. Um, you can bring it under control a little bit. Uh, you can try and penalize differences between frames to reduce that flicker. Um, so there are ways to manage that. And there are approaches that you can take, um, but it's still going to be quite incoherent because you, you're starting from scratch. You're generating a new image um, for every frame. And so you don't get to keep any of the work that you've done in the previous frame. So um, really cool technique in some cases, definitely manageable. Um, but let's try and see if we can do better. Um, but before we do that, any questions on this first demo? Cool, I don't see any yet, but feel free to, to chime them in. Okay, so the the one idea I'll put in here um, is, uh, thanks by the way, everyone who's commenting, I really like having the feedback. Um, what if we could take the previous GAN output, right, the generated frame, and warp it? Because if you look in this video, um, if we look at this frame versus this frame, the structure is generally the same. Most of it is static, um, but the dog's head has moved up. It hasn't changed into a new head, it's just moved slightly. And the tail's wagged a little bit, and the legs raised a little bit. And so we have this small bit of motion. And so if we could take the generated image and we could move it in the same way, then the GAN would have a lot less work to do to maintain the structure because everything's already in the right place, mostly. Um, so enter something called optical flow. And this is a technique for estimating motion in video, which is exactly what we want. Um, and specifically this idea of dense optical flow, it gives us, um, it gives us this kind of video here of how each pixel on the image is moving on a frame by frame basis. So really cool technique. There's lots and lots of different methods and approaches, many of which to be honest, I don't fully understand. <laughs> so um, what I've done here is create a, a little function that's going to take in two frames, right? And these are frames of our original video. This is um, dog one and dog two. Um, and it's gonna calculate how the pixels are moving in these two frames. And then it's gonna take in an image and it's gonna warp that image to try and match that motion, right? And it's calculating the optical flow using OpenCV's optical flow far and, far and back method. Um, I don't really understand how it works un under the hood, but it seems to work fairly well. All of these parameters are completely made up. <laughs> so feel free to check out the documentation and try and improve this. Um, but the idea here is that we are calculating the flow, right, the movement between these two frames, and then we're creating a, a map based on that to remap our image and warp it to sort of follow the motion. Um, hope that um, yeah, so little neat little function, we can kind of just define it and ignore it. Um, but now that we have this tool, we can add this key piece of code to our loop, right? So we're working frame by frame, but before we move on to the next frame, we can grab the current frame and we can warp it. We can say, based on this frame of the guiding video and the next frame, I'd like to update my image to try and match that motion. And then we re-encode this back such that when we start on the next frame, our starting point has already been morphed, right? So we're taking the task of matching the motion away from the GAN, which is not very good at it, and we're doing that manually. Um, so here again, let me start this running um, and then we can dive in. Um, yeah, so if we if we take a look at the code, so we're setting things up as usual, we've got a, a target text. Um, we're starting with the first frame, we're setting up our optimizer, and then for each frame, we're loading up the content target, right? We want to make it look kind of like the guide frame. And then we're spending some number of iterations, each of which is going to zero the gradients, image, calculate a loss, including a content loss, and update the, the, the Z, just like before. So this hasn't changed. Um, then we're going to display it. But every for every frame, so this is not for every iteration, this is just for every frame, 
once at the end of that process, before we move on to the next frame, we're going to get our image, we're going to warp it, we're going to re-encode it, and then we're going to move on to the next frame. Um, and so that warping step, hopefully, means that now we're able to keep going from where we were previously. This is just one continuous generation. We're not starting from a new Z, except that we're doing a small transform. So remember before where we were zooming in a little bit every few steps? Here we're just adding a bit of motion every few steps. And what it means is that the details in the background can stay relatively consistent. Right? They're going to be updated because we're spending some number of iterations on each frame, but they're not going to be wildly flickering in and out of existence like previously. And so the hope here is that we can end up tweaking and polishing and adjusting such that um, the overall motion kind of matches and we reduce the work that the GAN has to do to match the guiding video. Um, so it's definitely imperfect. Um, I think I've got a little demo here. Um, yeah, so you can see background is fairly consistent as the camera starts to move. The whole background shifts together. Um, but the downside is we've um, still got some flicker, right? We still, it's, it's by no means perfect. And you'd really have to mess with all of these sliders to try and figure out something that looks good for every individual frame, but also doesn't have too much disturbance frame to frame. Um, yeah, so it's a tricky, it's a tricky process. Um, but it is one that can generate some fairly fun results. Um, so while this is running, I don't think I'll let it run fully. Um, but I'll show a few of the, the results that I have been able to to generate using this kind of approach. Um, this is linked from the notebook if you're interested. Um, my favorite would be something like this, right, where we were starting from a guiding video of my wife and I doing some ballroom dancing. Um, and then the text prompt is... I don't know, a charcoal sketch figure drawing of two people dancing. Um, and if my internet ever worked reliably, we would be able to see the kind of fairly smooth motion um, and quite a pleasing overall effect. It really does look like a charcoal animation. Um, okay, I'll, oh, there we go. Um, now, this is very hard to, it's very hard to get something nice for every, decent video I end up generating with this technique, there's probably 10 or 20 or 50 <laughs> that really don't look nice at all. They have too much flicker or they're incoherent, um, but it is quite fun to explore. Um, although it takes time to, to generate and try things, um, you can find these kind of gems in amongst it. Um, some, some tips that I can give, um, if you store each Z value as you generate it, right? detach it and put it in a big list somewhere. You can interpolate between them afterwards to try and smooth things out. Um, you can also do a hang of a lot with post-processing. So some of these results here, they look really nice, um, but the raw output was some red, some blue, you know, really like unpleasant color flickering, even though the structure was nice. Um, so I've just turned them into monochrome and then recolored them in a video editor. And it suddenly looks much more satisfying and professional. So. Um, there's a lot of work you can do post-processing things to make them look better. Um, I had a warning today, someone mentioned if you've got, you know, red and blue flashes, it can be really triggering for people with epilepsy or even people who haven't had a seizure before. Um, yeah, so you can, it is worth spending a bit of time thinking, how can I make this smoother? Do I have, um, do I have some post-processing I can do to maybe fix the colors or do some sort of temporal denoising um, and smoothing. Um, yeah, but then generally, besides that, just really tweaking these parameters and messing about um, and hopefully finding some gems in there. Um, now, this is very much a, an experimental science. Um, I think give it another few years and we'll see this reaching the same sorts of levels as the image generation. But for now, it's, it's really um, a, a no man's land. Um, but it's quite fun to explore. Um, Hannah, I think, likes the dancing one, if my timing's right. Um, should the first frame be run for longer, um, considering we, we are continuing to keep it? That is an excellent question, and that's what I generally do for almost all of these. Um, to go from the start image, right, like if we watch one of these, watch one of these playing back, it starts out looking like the video, because we've only spent a few iterations on there. 
Um, so yes, I would say definitely uh, you can modify this code to say um, if i is less than t two or, or, or if for the first iteration do um, many more updates before we start moving on to the next frame. Um, and generally when I'm doing my own videos, I'll generate the image first, like the starting image. And then in, an, in, in another cell, in a sort of second operation, I'll use that as the first frame and go from there. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a really good tip, running the first frame for a while so that you don't start on, you know, something that looks very much like the original video and then moving forward into, um, yeah, into uh, more and more abstract representations. Um, okay, while this is running, um, one thing you can do here, if you remove the content weight entirely, in other words, saying we're going to start from the first frame, but besides that, we're not going to reference the external video at all, apart from using it for optical flow, um, then it lets you kind of give up any pretense of following the video too exactly, but you still get the motion. Um, so this is an example of that. This is that same cell with no content loss, only the flow, only the motion from the video. And you can see it's able to deviate a lot more from the original video, but it still has that motion. It still looks like something running as the background's moving. Um, and you can get some really trippy effects with this. I will quite often use a, a reference video of some motion. Um, where's the one I want? Um, here, like right, right back up to this most recent Halloween piece. Um, the reference video looks nothing like this, but it has the general motion that I wanted. Um, in fact, let me show you the original video. Um, yeah, so it's something like this um, rendered out and then used just as the optical flow to give, give the motion. Um, and the final result looks something like... I hope that's not too creepy for everyone or too flickery. Um, yeah. Uh, and then that's the end of the, the formal notebook. We're under an hour. I think that's the quickest lesson we've done so far. Um, but I thought it would be good to kind of end it there as far as the, um, as far as the formal content goes, but I've hopefully given you a whole box of tools. Um, and so now the option is up to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll stop recording. Um, but we can chat if you'd like, um, about, ideas that you have, or if you'd like to come back to one of the sections that we covered. Um, yeah, we're, we're able to do that now um, as a sort of end to the lesson.